policy enforcing everything. Um, and then the, the thing I see that's a problem with that is other processes that are highly privileged can also just talk to the kernel and they're unaudited. Uh, and we, ha we need to have some kind of kernel enforcement, um, which the policy file could then move into the, the kernel and be stored there somehow. And we get into the problem of how we want to update the policy file. Uh, the thought I had was to essentially add a uh, signature uh, to the program itself. And the signature is going to encode uh, some extensions. So we add a code sign instruction, which must be the first byte. Uh, this allows us to quickly determine whether we're uh, able to enforce uh, code signing that, uh, on the first byte from in the kernel. Uh, then we have the signature, the signature extensions in the eBPF program. The signature covers the extensions in eBPF program. Uh, what I would propose is uh, binding the identity. And there is some haziness here for me personally because I'm not very familiar with how C groups work. Uh, but I think we want to encapsulate uh, identity at a very uh, granular level. And this could allow for a program to run as a lower privileged user uh, based on a higher fleet-wide policy. Um, and then we would add some kernel flags for enforcing signatures and a default trusted public pol uh, key. Uh, yeah, go ahead. So this is basically more, since it is very security related, right? Could you explain what you think about, what does identity mean here? Like, is it, a, it is, is it a user, public, private key or something, or how does that work? Uh, so the identity I was thinking uh, would be, uh, so it will be a delegation. Um, and the identity uh, I was thinking of was would be, we would map it to something on the machine at runtime, essentially. Um, I don't think we want to do a public-private key pair because you don't want to ship the private key with everything, uh, and that is why. So what we're going to trust is a root key. And uh, I think if, you've, if you're familiar with the uh, SSH uh, certificate format, something similar to that might be more apropos for eBPF, where you have principles that are allowed to be, this is, this is allowed to run as, essentially. Did you have other questions there? Or does that explain everything? Or did you want to, like? I, I think this makes sense. OK. So uh, I, I want to introduce the concept of, of a like signatory service, which may or may not be on the same machine. Uh, we should definitely have a reference implementation that ships on the machine to make it very easy to you know, test this. But if you're talking at a fleet scale uh, or like a big business where you have a bunch of machines, you may want to have this off somewhere else, kind of like your identity and access management. <clears throat> so essentially, the user uh, makes a request to the signatory service after they've generated their program and says, hey, I want to sign this. And then based on that user's uh, abilities, it will sign the program with the appropriate uh, allowed, ex allowed capabilities on it. Uh, and then that program is sent to the kernel, and the kernel verifies this uh, at load, essentially. And it says, you are, uh, when it goes through the verifier, it should be able to, uh, before we even verify, we should be able to check the signature and say this is a signature that tr goes to the trusted root key. And then the um, capabilities are pulled out and make sure that all the capabilities in the extensions match the capabilities that the program is actually trying to use in the verifier. And if any of that fails, uh, give up, error, no permission. Um, if that succeeds, then go off to do all the dynamic translation necessary just in time and try and run your program. Uh, there are some open questions I have. Um, so does the identity model like break down somehow with C groups? Like how do we represent it? Like what needs to be represented when you start talking about namespaces? Um, do we need to support revocation lists uh, and like there's a, there's a big trade-off here when you make a decision on whether you want to support revocation versus whether you want to use short-lived credentials. Uh, if you use short-lived programs where you resign them constantly, now you have the problem of I need to have a pretty high uptime signing service that deals with this all the time. Um, or you can uh, insert the concept of like time-bounded uh, into the credential itself and say that some of these are 15-minute programs for an engineer that's delegated. Or, and these other static programs that the fleet deploys on a regular basis are good for months. Uh, and that would potentially solve that problem. But there's a, a trade-off to be made here. 
And I don't have the answer, and I don't know if there's a one-size-fits-all answer for this. Uh, it may be something that we might want to have flexibility on. So I just wanted to separate the, because the unprivileged and the identity concepts are a little bit more advanced, to the, to the, on a very basic principle, right? If we have an EDPF instruction byte that is signed by a trusted authority, mm -hmm. and that, that signature can be verified in the kernel. Now, there, there are, uh, there's a couple of differences since we last talked about this, right? We were talking about file-based signatures, right? Mm -hmm. There's no concept of a file in a VPF program, so the, the, the signature is effectively in the program bytecode itself. It yes. Be, that, is, that is sort of one key difference here. And I don't know about identity yet. Like, we, we in a privileged, like, sort of user space uh, where VPF programs are only allowed by root, I don't think identity matters that much, as long as the program is signed by a trusted authority or the generator of the program in case of dynamic. I mean, we could also eliminate that if we think it's not a useful feature, right? Like, start with the, the smallest thing that works. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah. I mean, do you, do you need to decide up front what the identity is? Because I, I worry about identity, because identity is, means different things to different people, right? Um, and I'm not sure, like, in this model, do you, do you have more slides, by the way? Am I cutting off other slides? No, no, no. Okay. I, I kept cool. it short because good, I figured good. this would be, like, we've had oh. a very open-ended conversation on this for <laughs> quite a while from what sure. I read into. So, it, in, in my view, I think that the kernel piece should be a BPF program that I can write, and then you can write your BPF program, and then we can sort of evolve independently if we want, and eventually probably some, there'll be some common thing that lives there, I would suspect, over time. But we don't have to agree on identity at that point, right? Like, my identity can be whatever my customers mm -hmm. want, and your identity can be whatever your fleet wants. Yep. Um, and I actually know we have customers with different notions of identity for whatever reasons, right? And we also, um, I would say, like, we have, I know people want re revocation lists and this. I've, I've heard people talk about it, so, like, but maybe that doesn't make any sense to you. Right, so like I'm not sure, like I guess I would be try to break it down to like what do we need in BPF to support this and like try to remain as flexible as possible so that we're not encoding something into the kernel that that like everybody has to do. So, I uh, I would say that what I would like to see is the kernel become the enforcement point for um, the the checking of the signature and whatever extensions you want to support and if we want to make a helper program for different policies in that certificate that might be an appropriate place to do that uh, so that you can have that concept of identity segregated for each use case and user um, thoughts I mean, so there's a there's a we alluded to yesterday about a mod mod verify sig sort of uh, helper yesterday I, I think like it, we we may not it, there is an instruction byte. We have access to the program when the BPF program is being loaded. We could encode the signature verification in the BPF verifier itself and add a kernel config, but that sort of disallows the flexibility, John, you were talking about. So you could do this signature verification check in at BPF prog in, in that hook there, use the helper that we discussed yeah. yesterday of some sort, and then we have verification. And you don't need a config, like when you say, yeah. You do need any early boot to make sure this comes up upside. And it's cut you off, sorry. Um, I do think you need to get that program in an early boot, and we need to have a way to freeze it so it can't be unloaded, right? Because you, mm -hmm. you do want it to be in the trusted boot, probably with Correct. TPM at the bottom or whatever your platform does. There are two pieces yes, from, that we connect from yesterday, right? Like Roberto's use case about early boot PPF and in the block area as well, and then the signature verification stuff. Uh, so I'm looking at this from the cross-platform perspective because I want something that works on both Linux and Windows, and I think everything that we're talking about is actually applicable to both, and I agree with John's comment about you know, using the gatekeeper-style thing instead of hard-coding it into the verifier or the kernel or whatever else. Um, the one question that I have for you is when you talked about the first byte in the instruction, it sounded like you were putting this in line with the program itself as yes. opposed to metadata about the program. No, I, I and that's was... the one part that I find perhaps questionable as to why you'd put it in the program. And I'm thinking about uh, scenarios like, I wanna take the same program and have multiple signatures. So my, like, I take uh, your program, I vet it, and then I re-sign the same program with my signature for use on my, in my fleet, right? Mm -hmm. Even though you wrote the program and you sign it first, I'm gonna you know, countersign it or replace the signature or whatever. And it seems to me that that's much easier to do by putting it into maybe a separate ELF section and then passing it down along with the program. Because as long as you have the, the same key signing it, 
and you're signing the same bytes and the signature matches, it shouldn't matter exactly how you encode it. And I can imagine the encoding could actually vary by platform. I don't know if it needs to vary by platform, but it could, right? That's so, kind of what I'm wondering. So what, 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 uh, Microphone. What, uh, so, sorry, the, what, what you're proposing, uh, or like what is proposed here is the, you don't need to change the BP of syscall here. In that case, you have a file, you have the attribute, you will need a, probably a .sync okay. yeah, yeah. field. Right. Uh, so one way to put those two together is yeah. to say that on Linux, the way that you map it into the syscall is by putting it back to back and saying prepending it, right? And on a different one that uses a different syscall mechanism, right, mm -hmm. that has, passes two fields, you wouldn't necessarily have to do that. So it could be that the prepending stuff is so a Linux-specific thing as opposed to an EVPF generic. I, I would also say that the instruction bytecode doesn't prohibit anything you said there, uh, in so much that you could still wrap an instruction bytecode with an instruction bytecode, and that, that would be a payload wrapping mechanism. As long as your kernel understands that, it would still be fine. Um, maybe I didn't yeah. totally follow, but wouldn't it be simpler just to put it as a, new, a field in the attribute that you load? Like we could just add it at the end, and here's a signature array. Yeah, I, like I mean the, the implementation. The, yeah, because if I look at say in Mateo's patch, he did something that was alongside, not in the program or whatever. So that's what made me think about it because this was a new way of, of talking about it or whatever that's different from say how Mateo was using it. So. so the one thing I, I want to uh, strongly uh, talk about is the um, that when we do this signature. Uh, however we do it, that we are signing both the capabilities and extensions as well as the eBPF program. Yeah. The easiest okay. way is to get those aligned side by side so they don't get messed up is, you know, in line. If you start splitting the program different and putting the, uh, the capabilities somewhere else, it, it's a chance to screw up the verification or a chance to uh, allow uh, somebody. I mean, so in this case, I'm calling the capabilities uh, potentially an identity. Uh, what the what the uh, BPF calls may be allowed from like the core framework as well, uh, things like that essentially. Like, are you allowed to uh, write data or are you only allowed to read data? Um, yeah. These could be things we could do. None of these are mandatory, but I, I'm calling capabilities just this generic catch bag of extensions that could be added uh, based on use cases. Yeah, the concept of capability shows up in a bunch of other security contexts, right? Whether it's a I don't know what the, the specific term and use of, of certificates and, and IPsec, the term escapes me right now, that's uh, EKU, yeah. So it's similar kind of than EKU uses. It says you're authorized to do the following things yeah. and you can't go outside that. And, and, so and so X509 that's a good idea. and EKU is the, the common way of doing it, yeah, yes. Yeah. So I think that part is a good idea, so. But it's just everything else, it seems to me like it's, it could be done either way, that uh, whether you encode it prepend or whether you encode it as a separate field or whatever, yeah. depending. We, it seems to me like it's isomorphic either way. Anything you can do with one, you can do the other one. And so if we say that this should be done cross-platform, you know, that's okay. I don't know if that's going to cause any other constraints. I don't know. That was my question. So. So, just, so this is how I map it in my head, and you can correct me if this is, mm -hmm. correct, uh, this is a, an, an incorrect representation of the capability stuff. Right? You have this byte that, is veri that, that verifies the sort of... Uh, who built this program, right? The, who signed this program? That that bit is checked there, and then there is a mini sort of LSM like policy there. This is what you can do with this. You should be able to do based on your credentials, and that I've given you this permission, right, from mm -hmm. an external entity, and the, this is what you're allowed to do. And your mod mod verify sig in the BPF broke LSM hook just basically then after it verifies signature expands this policy or capability stuff into various checks that it can make. Okay, these helper calls, this stuff, right? That bit, I think, is more advanced, right? Like currently, the the m mechanism that we're looking for at BPF programs, especially due to like side channel stuff, is all or none, right? Like mm -hmm. our programs that are generated by trusted so command line delegates. Are I agree that it is more complex. I also would state that it's not necessary for the first cut of anything. Yeah. These are these are all. That's why I, I, I'm calling capabilities like this grab bag of whatever we want for whenever we need it. But, but, but you're right in pointing this out because this is not a one, two, three year thing, right? We want this to live long enough that it can be extended. Yeah, I, uh, I, don't, I don't think we want to deal with um, uh, like a, a, an API change for how we do signing. And I think that's why this has been stuck up so long, uh, potentially. Yeah, it's, it's very different from like simple engineering stuff that is, you ain't gonna need it again, mm -hmm. but it's more, it has to be future-proof when you're designing the stuff. It, it's design resilience, yeah. uh, and maybe we never use any of it except for like whatever use cases that immediately come to mind to the people in this room. I, I think identity is something that some people care about. At which point and what are you signing? At which points? Uh, so uh, 
the signatory service is doing the signing uh, of the program. The byte code. The byte code. Uh, which byte code? Like before it got like relocated, all the subprograms got added and all the stuff, or after? I was saying before, and then any translation that happens in the kernel, essentially. So like use cases like BPF trace, which is like out of the question in this. Uh, so what I would think is that BPF trace could still work if it had the ability to talk to the signatory service as a flag. And we, if we standardize the, the way that works, then signing still works, right? So you're saying like you will trust BPF trace to do the uh, signing? To talk to the signing service. Uh, like what's the mechanism of trusting BPF trace, I guess? Because yeah. like it doesn't seem BPF related at all, right? Like how? Yeah, there is, there is a, I have a talk today about like we, we, the way we could do this, like we can do it with, you can create a policy domain of like dynamically generated BPF programs that are actually trusted and are allowed to write, run unsigned code at that point, right? Or, or they can, as Jason mentioned, you can talk to a signatory service and hey, hey, hi. So in that scenario, like if we allow BPF trace to like do its own signing verification, right? Like what does BPF trace provide to the kernel to, you know, prove to the kernel that like this BPF program is okay to run? Yeah, so I, I can write. I could. Okay. <laughs> I, I mean, so, so for, for like our case, we would do, you would, when the BPF trace started, right, it would be signed. So like you would know that that application is BPF trace. And then you would, you would also know things like where it's running, like what's the context, like you'd have the UID, the GID, like all of this stuff, like is it in a pod? Like, and you probably would also know, you, you might care about the attach point, but probably, like, first cut, probably not. And so you'd say, like, okay, at least I trust this application, and I trust it to run in this context, right? right? And at that point, we would probably just audit it, right? Like, right, but then there is no signature that you are sending no, to the no, kernel, right? No, I mean, like, these... You, you, could, you could still do the signature, right? You could still apply a signature from in BPF trace. But, but what, does the, what does the signature mean, right? Like, well, well, I mean, why? All like, the, all the trust... signature... What the signature gives you is it, it lets you put enforcement on it, the kernel, right? So now the kernel can, if you want enforcement on it, so it works. That, that would be a, so imagine the signature has some capability checks there, right? And the capabilities encode what BPF tool should generally be allowed to do. And if it, if it, if BPF tool some, somehow generates something that somebody's found a, a thing that is trying to exploit something in BPF tool, or BPF trace, sorry, uh, then it would, signature would be like, hey, you're not supposed to do that, uh, and you're doing that. Okay, so signature is not just like some hash function of like the bytes. It's like something more composed of like bits, what's allowed and all that stuff. Yeah, I, well, I, I think okay. some of this was, you'd ask the question is how does the signatory service know that BPF trace is the thing that's doing it? And I think that's what we were just responding to. It says, uh, okay, as long as BPF trace is signed and so on, the kernel would trust whatever key the signatory service has, which could be on box, right? Was what Jason, Jason yeah. was saying before, right? So there's such like a local RPC call, right? And so the signatory service, if the kernel is the only key that it trusts, is if you're using public private keys, right? Then the private key would be held by the signatory service. If you're using something other than keys, it's whatever it is, right? That the kernel has. Um, and so the signatory service is what is then checking all that, you know, is it running in a particular context? Is it really BPF trace and so on? So I think that's what the, we were trying to answer to your question of how does the signatory service know? The kernel still only trusts the signatory service in JSON's diagram. I don't know if that answers your question, but I think that was, that was how, how I was just say there's like the other option is to get, just not use the signatory service for BPF trace and have the kernel verify, like I know that this, this application and I know that this UID and this, all this kind of stuff. And, and I think that's what you're saying when you're saying you could just put it all into an eBPF program and one BPF program would, hey, would know that it's BPF trace, another one would just use signatory service keys and we don't have to agree on that because people can use different gatekeeper programs. I'm, I'm just a little, I mean, having done like 50, Yeah, they, they can get complex, and we should we should avoid complexity where where we can. Yeah, I mean, this may not be the right solution. Maybe there is a better solution we can come to in this meeting, right? Like that's why we're here today. Well, uh, I like this picture because you specifically said the signatory service could be on box or off box, and I like well, I guess I like the left half of this picture. 
I liked the right half of the picture in the other one that was John's diagram that had the, the gatekeeper program on it. I mean, I think yeah, you could one. still combine right. these two right. together. Exactly. That's my point, is I would combine these two, put the gatekeeper on the right side of this one, and the signatory service on the left side of this one, say the signatory service could be on box, out of box, could be bundled into the application. Like if the signatory service was bundled into BPF trace, you'd get one variation we were talking about. Um, and so all those are possible, just different ways to compose these. But I would put this picture and the other picture together into one diagram. I saw that when you said by the solution, and I picked up the mic, so let's see. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's it. I, I, I'm curious to see what you folks think about this. Well, just wanted to like remind everyone what Andre was alluding to, that the programs themselves, like it's a completely useless piece of thing to sign because like there's so much libpf does after it's parsing like elf doing relocation adjusting sections messing with the function so it's the only thing so like yeah, it's only like very the most trivial programs that don't use maps at all can be just simply signed and will not be modified by the law order, by user space law order. i i agree with this right this is the signature here assumes like the, that the bytecode that is generated by the compiler itself at that point uh, before runtime relocations is sort of uh, could we have you ever considered like doing these relocations in the kernel like is it ever going to be the case that we're going to do these relocations in the kernel so well that's what we've been doing for the last year right so slowly moving all of the pieces that libpf does into the kernel so once so, once they are in the kernel though then you have the capability of of putting that all behind a signature check Sort of. So, uh, so the way it is right now, uh, we have this loader program that can be generated as part of this like light skeleton. What it, it consists of at the end, like it has, uh, consists of two main pieces. One is a big map, array of one element, and the program. So both need to be signed. So this program, this loader program, essentially is executor of the instructions, the pseudo instructions that are in this array. And inside the array, there can be 10 different programs with the attachment points, 20 different maps, how they create, how they populate it, and so on and so forth. So uh, just going to add that I, uh, I like the idea of having all the relevant relocations here be done post-signature in a trusted component. On Linux, that's in the kernel. On Windows, it's in a trusted user land process that basically runs with the same privileges as the kernel. It's just a different address space, right? Um, and so that same direction that Jason is proposing, if you do that, then I think that is abstract enough to work, even though the details are different between Linux and Windows, the concept is, is exactly the same between the two of them, which is you check the signature, you do all the relocations in the appropriate spot on the trusted side, right? It, that you don't do any of the relocations until after you've confirmed that the signature matches and that you're gonna be doing what you're gonna be doing, and then you can do all the relocations before you actually you know, install the, the jitted code or whatever it is, so. so I think fundamentally, right, like you have, what you mentioned here, right, there is a loader program that is a, that encodes the actions that are being going to be taken by an intermediary like libbpf or something, right? And and then what you do is you sign these actions plus the original instruction blob, right? Which is fine. The the format of the signature that Jason proposed is is a byte in the beginning of the program. What follows is the uh, is all the other stuff, right? The actions that are going to be taken by uh, by by our meta like the loader program and the actual instruction byte itself. So. I, I, the, the issue is with the verification check on how you're going to verify that stuff. So just another quick comment on like this first first signature, uh, first new instruction like encoding like the signature. I still don't see like any point uh, of doing that instead instead of like just providing the signature as a, like another property when you do BPF proc load, right? Like, uh, is there any benefit to like embedding it into the instruction? Set? Why? The, the like only, either way, you need to change kernel, right? So uh, you just extend the syscall. You don't have to change the syscall. Yes, so that, that, but that, like, you that, have to change the kernel. Like, even if you don't change the syscall, yeah. like well, just to support this, right? If you, so if you want the enforcement at the kernel, then you have to change the kernel anyway, right? I mean, you don't, right. though, right? Like, you, you currently you just need a helper that Roberto proposed yesterday. Okay. Yeah. And we, then and then you verify it in the BPF program. Uh, so and, and we add the sorry, I forgot that we're talking about the, the BPF gatekeeper hybrid model right now. The the the, the, the kernel a, a, a API or ABI change is the helper that mm -hmm. we add, and that helper is beyond this particular signature use. Do you, do you have a microphone? Uh, yeah. Sorry. But like, if verifier doesn't know about this instruction and doesn't skip it or does something with it, 
the program should be rejected. So like either way, you need to teach Verifier about it. Like if you are going to teach Verifier, you might as well just like teach the syscall to to get like this as a separate property. I agree. I I, I think this is like f the Verifier change in, to me is not a an API. Uh, it, like it's fine. The Verifier is going to skip skip instructions. Instruction set is an API. Yeah, it it's is. It's an ABI. Let's say it's like even stronger basically. Like because like. Part of this yeah. is called you sort of can like deprecate like while well, with instruction set it's I I'm personally ambivalent as to how we encode the signature as, as yeah so so that was one like but another one like I want to make this more interesting right so let's say we even solve all this problem that like program code itself is like not changeable unless uh, until it gets to the kernel right what do we do about like different attachment points right so like you can verify the U probe or K probe. And then attach it to many different functions, and that might be might have like some security implications, Policy, right? The, the capability stuff. This this would say that like the uh, this function should be always attached. Now, like, if you if you encode this, so imagine. So basically, like this magic signature encodes like everything that's possible to do in BPF. Like, so, okay, who who this this becomes like a language basically. Because the capabilities of like BPF are like super diverse, right? So like. K probe targets, U probe targets, like F entry targets, and like other different, like they, they are not always like just one string that you attach to, it's, right? It's if you care about this, right? Like if you care about the attachment point there, if you, if you consider that like you don't, you're, you don't have an extra policy that is sort of enforcing this stuff and you want this to be in the signature, then it could be in the signature. Otherwise, you could just say like, look. Uh, so this signature is like passed through into like some custom BPF program in the kernel and like Kernel meaning like verifier, let's say, doesn't know about its format. Is that the idea? That's what it's currently not... proposing. Yeah. I see. Okay, so it's just like some black box set of bytes. Yeah. That we just like wire through into like custom BPF program that makes ultimate decision. Some word like that in my head. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I don't even. It wasn't clear. Even Sorry. Okay. Today. So like verifier, just like if you want, you verify. If not, like we just ignore the signature basically. No, I would just like put it as another field in the struct, pass it all the way through, pass that attribute to the. No, the, the important like the, the thing that I didn't understand yeah. like the important thing is like this signature like verifier and kernel itself doesn't need to understand like its yeah. format because if it is then like it's right like, this whole committee discussion like what right. you put there and okay which is why I think it's best to put I it see. in so the we program. keep it like custom black box to like specific solution right yeah. okay uh, that's mine. I was wondering, do you have a, or like, would there be a use case where you have several sections of the program with different signatures or incapabilities, maybe, at some point, like uh, given it's encoded? You, so you're, you're, so you're assuming like a, a helper that's more restricted than the, the parent, or? No, no, like so, so, so that basically your, your pseudo instruction for the signature verification would only cover some part of the program, and then you can have like a different part with different signature and capabilities, for example. Uh, I was not envisioning that. Okay. It seems a, like a lot of complexity. <laughs> okay. but, but that would be an argument in the favor of putting it in the instruction set. That's what. Yeah. That, yeah. If you can, if you have multiple signatures uh, in the in the instruction bytecode, then your. Well, the, the, you, it gives you the ability to wrap multiple signatures. But he's talking about actually partially signing the program, I believe, and, and partial signatures. I like I. I struggle with a use case for partial KP, signature. I really data. don't like the idea of new instructions here. Like okay, yeah, they are not yeah. like there is nothing like BPF instruction set is like x86 and ARM and MIPS and all combined. Do you have an instruction x86 that says verify me signature? I don't know. Are we talk about SGX. <laughs> so uh, I, I, I even even the... even SGX is different. Like yeah. um, so. Uh, I think Andre's question about what are you signing and is it before or after? And I said, well, this is what Jason's proposal was. And I had a chance to think about it uh, myself to see what would the equivalent be on uh, Windows or potentially other runtimes. Um, on Windows, the verifier is not in the kernel. It's up in trusted user land. Okay. And so the question is, are you checking? So if you were to think about the gatekeeper program or checking up signatures, is that done before or after verification? Okay. Now, in Jason's answer, you do it before verification. Okay, what that means is that if you were going to do the verification, sorry, if you're going to do the signature checking in a gatekeeper program, that means you need the gatekeeper program to be running in user land prior to verification, right? Because the verification, you never even hit the kernel. Okay, um, that's complicated. It's possible to run EBPR programs in user land, but we haven't done any of that work, right? And so that's actually fairly complicated. 
You could also say it's done afterwards. You could say that it depends on your implementation. Just like if you have multiple gatekeeper programs, you don't have to agree. You can just say, oh, well, that's up to the platform. You could actually have multiple gatekeeper programs, one before, one after, if you want to apply that concept, right? Uh, or maybe it varies by platform. So all these, I think, are possible here that uh, I think if you said, and if you said that, it, that the gatekeeper program needed to run um, after verification, then having it be in the instruction set is odd because now the verifier runs on something that has this extra instruction. It's just odd, right? So that's why I didn't like the, the, the separate instruction thing. It's possible to do, it's just work, right? Sure. Um, but I did want to think about the notion of saying um, the signature checking, I can imagine cases for doing it both before and after verification, either for different platforms or even different use cases on the same platform. So, so I think Andre's question was- I'm uh, not sure how it will work on Windows when like verifier separately, but at least yeah. in the Linux kernel, what yeah. we can do is to uh, check the verify the signature before starting the verification, but but then it only will be like a Boolean flag. Did it pass the verification? Then during the verification, we will have several LSM-like callbacks that will check like whether this particular helper is called and so on and so forth. Like during the verification, there will be many times the secondary gatekeeper program will be called, and at the end of the verification, that will be the final decision. Because like verification itself, like after verification, we cannot do the signature check because verification changes the code as well. Like it massages the code quite a bit, so the code is not at all as it was in the beginning. So it has to be like many, many steps, one in the beginning, then several calls during and at the end. Yeah, um, the, uh, another direction that we're looking towards for the future, and I think this conversation has happened across platform, but I don't remember which context it was in, whether it was in BPF meetings and EPPF summit, a LEAF meeting or uh, EBPF for Windows meeting or some combination of all of those, which is, um, is it possible to run the verifier off box? In other words, if the fact that something has been signed, does that mean it has been signed and verified by the signatory service, and therefore you can skip the verification step because you know the verifier has already passed with the current kernel version? Okay. Is it possible to offload that, in which case you get a bunch of CPU cycles back because you're avoiding the verification step? Okay. So is it possible to do that? Is it a bunch of work? Yes. But is it possible to say my gatekeeper program causes it to bypass verification because it knows the signature has that thing set that says the signatory service has already done that for me? Okay. Is that possible to do? Is it might be a good long-term direction. It is one that's being discussed. And so I think some of the things that Jason is talking about is actually aligned with, with, with helping in that direction should people want to go in that direction. I don't think there's anything prohibiting what you just described. That's right. That's what, one of the things I like about this is it certainly doesn't prohibit it, and it may even make some things be easier. For the in Linux, we can like if this initial signature check passed, we can skip probably ninety percent of the verifier, but not not all of it. Like like dead code elimination, you have to like. I don't even know if you can skip ninety, right? Like for dead code elimination, you actually need to trace the the the, the state and know like which ifs are taken and not. So, um, but really, like in practice, like is it that that much CPU time spent like in verification? You verify once and run it like millions and billions of times. I so far, it was never like really such a big <laughs> problem. <laughs> if the verification is like considerable uh, concern, like the verification time itself, like CPU use for verification, let's say. So, I don't think so. Does anyone have a use case where they're loading BPF programs like very often that need to be signed? So not very fast. So uh, it would be useful if somebody has statistics for uh, like recovery from a DOS attack, right? Where you are, where you don't have a lot of CPU cycles. How much of a difference does it make to have to go through uh, verification? Does it slow things down because you're already maxed out? I don't know. So if somebody has stats, it'd be interesting. So. So uh, uh, this is probably my naive understanding. The signature is like uh, you claim what uh, you do, and you need someone to verify you actually, this is what you do, you didn't do anything else, right? No, that might be wrong, but I think that's, that's my understanding. Let me know if that's totally wrong. But I think that's the, the state of truth is like what this program is do is in the verifier, right? So the verifier knows exactly this program does this helper, not that helper, but 
to me, like the, the signature service should be together with the verifier. Uh, it's the verifier to say what uh, this program is really doing. That's the state of truth. And so, so, why so, do that twice? So signature certificate is like a, a, a verification of like, or, or, or a stamp or a certificate of authenticity, right? Like I build this, this program was, I, I know about this program, I, there is, some, there is some reference to the I here, like who am I, that is a part of the signature, right? And I certify that this BPF program Blah blah blah, right? So that is that is the that is the that is what the signature represents here. It's more than just policy checks. Uh, if we so, also, uh, if you're doing enforcement in the kernel, m maybe you have a workflow where you want to not allow an engineer to do something with a, a BPF program in production, unless somebody else signs off on that. And it's very hard to do that without some kind of additional service signing off on that. And that's what the signatory service allows you to do is to build in that additional complexity for a large fleet. Uh, I think there's still two sides. One is like what does the program actually do? And the other side is whoever initiated this uh, uh, program, load this program, whether he's capable to do that. Mm -hmm. I think that's the two part of it. I think the verifier is still the owner to is the state of truth of what the program actually do. Yes, but what if you want to disallow, even though they have root privileges, what if you want to disallow somebody from making right calls to something? So that's, like, let's go back to, I think that's the idea. It's like you do the verifier, verifier say this program do, then after the verifier you say, okay, this program does this, and here's the what, uh, here's my ticket, I can do this. So, so I think there will be the after verifier. Oh, that's the keeper? So, so just, just, just to like, uh, two concepts here, right? This is the, what Jason mentioned there is the, the capability or the Mac aspect of the signature that we talked about. That is, that is a secondary goal of the whole signature thing. Now, talking about the secondary goal, the Mac policy hook for BPF is located before the verifier. It's like BPF probe hook is before the verifier logic itself. This is where you read the instruction code and try to decipher. You have the syscall arguments, you have the instruction code, you see is this a BPF program that my Mac policy allows to be going further? And the verifier is actually doing, uh, as, as Alexei mentioned, significant changes uh, to, the, to, the, to the instruction bytecode. So the Mac policy check point is already established in the kernel, and that is before the verifier. So if we need to move that check after verify, then that is, that is independent of this discussion, right? We, 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 will, we, will, we can move it after verify if you think this is the right place, but that is independent of this particular discussion. The other aspect of signatures there is, I think, I think you, you probably understand that, the main aspect is to establish this BPF program is known to be a good program, right, From, by, by this entity. And it represents the sort of connection between this entity and this program. That is what the signature sort of represents. It's just the capability part. Yes. The signature service only provides the capability part. And uh, the, I, I mean, this, the signature service is just acting as a stamp of approval. Yeah. So it, it, the signature, signature service will not do analysis of the bytecode? The signature service can do whatever you want it to do, but it could do analysis of the bytecode. It could also skip analysis and be like, yep, that's a program, and here are the capabilities assigned with this identity. And if those turn out to be not true later, that could be a different problem to be solved at the verification time. For example, I would, I want to, uh, I would just finish. So I want to say that like uh, all BPF programs should be built on this machine that is my like trusted build server, right? And then I, I need to ensure that when the kernel loads this program, this part of the BPF program being built in a trusted build server is checked. Uh, this is done, if you have a private key in that trusted build server, it signs the BPF program, the program is shipped with the signature, the signature is verified. So that, that, would, that would be. So this signature, right, like it, it's like cryptographically signed so like you cannot like spoof it, right? So like random, like unprivileged, incorrect process cannot just like substitute it, right? So this is an important point, like probably would be nice to like, for non-security folks to, to emphasize it. Like this signature, once you get it, right, like you can verify that it's truthful, right? How did you get it? That's not like the kernel's concern basically, right? And then like to, to Song's point, right, that like you, we will need to teach verifier like about all those capabilities. If we do that, then the signature format becomes like an API, right? Because like verifier needs to understand. I think like the alternative to that would be like to instrument verifier, right? Like with interesting points, right? So like helper like is called and like stuff like that. And then like maybe call 
whole program, I think we talked about this, but like I'm kind of summarizing, right? We'll have like hook or trace point or whatever, some mechanism to, to, to make decisions before the program is verified. During the program is verified, like we'll have like helper called, map was created, stuff like that, right? And then after that, like we can still pass like the finalized, like dead code removed uh, BPF instructions, maybe jitted instructions, yeah. and let the program also like process it if they really want to. That's like a lot of complexity, but if someone wants to go to, to, to great lands yeah. to do that, they can actually analyze BPF instructions, right? Like we have BPF loop now. <laughs> so I think that would be like the, the way to like keep this signature completely black box to the verifier, which would be good, right? I mean, and that's to the capability part of the signature, which I think currently is... Microphone. Is, uh, sorry. Yeah, the, this is to the capability part of the, uh, of the signature, right? Where, where we think like this is a future extension that we, we will need or like the first, first yeah, basic... The solution, right? Like just black box to the verifier. We don't need to like change kernel each time. Uh, each agreed, time. agreed. I, I, like, I like the proposal for the capability verification if this needs to be in the verifier as Song pointed, right? But the, the other thing which I wanted to like for the signature part, the basic thing is to establish that identity based verif the verification of this like there is a, the, i have a signing key i've signed this program right there is a verification key in the kernel that verification key verifies the signature all of this is cryptographic math nobody can spook it so there are these components you, you can correct me if i'm wrong correct. i think that is where we have landed right now yes okay so uh, uh, i just it just feel weird to me it's like the verifier is check every bit of your dna and the security build server just gave you an ID. This is a valid, like this trusted person. But like the verifier is looking at this like much more great details. So I think in the model that Andre was mentioning, um, then the job of the verifier is just to check safety. It's not whether it's authorized, it's whether it's safe. And it happens to generate, oh, by the way, here's what it did, right? So it used the following capabilities, but it doesn't, it, it, it only checks safety. It's then the gatekeeper's job whether or the, the the signature checking job right to say um, which could be before or after the verifier and i think doing what you said actually allows it to be done either before or after because you're basically doing an and gate that says okay as long as it's safe and as long as the signature only authorizes the capabilities that the verifier says that it uses right then it doesn't matter which order you do them in what Song is proposing is a, is a question to the threat model that is a signature is trying to solve so i'll give you an example right for i i build a bpf program uh, the BPF program is a valid program. The verifier is going to accept it. The, and I, I, I write some C code. This is compiled by Clang to generate some bytecodes at the end. Now, it was not built on a trusted server, so the Clang is a, is a malicious Clang, right? What it does is it adds a little side channel gadget into the middle of the program, which the verifier cannot detect. Valid BPF code does branch target buffer poisoning, right? And, and then, yes. So. Verifier has no way to know that like this was generated by a malicious clang, right? And has added instructions in the middle. So what that signature represents is the is your trust essentially for for our use case or like our use case for this is is this build tool chain that I use to build this program is trustable. I would put it that verifier checks like technical correctness of the program, so like array bounds checks, while signature provides like the intention correctness. So, like yes, the intent is like known and we are okay with it, given it's correct technically, right? So verifier like still does it as if it was root, with like all the capabilities, but like then we need to make decision whether like to pass it like further if it's correct. I think that's how you, yeah. right? Okay. I have a question regarding like so, if if you have like a I don't know a BPF trace version and it's running on a machine, so how does it talk to the signatory service and how does signatory service make sure it's it's actually the BPF trace it pretends to be? So how does it look in practice? I mean, I'm just. So are we talking uh, <coughs> on like a personal computer, or are we talking like fleet scale? So what I would imagine is some kind of like we would define some kind of, if we were going to have BPF trace be able to talk to a signatory service, right, we would define a, like an API contract for how you talk to a signatory service, and anyone can implement that doing whatever they need to do, right? Uh, and if, if my, my, my signatory service wants to do some additional verifications, like that you're coming from a certain location in the world, and you're running as this UID, GID, and I can map that to this internal identity, uh, then we can do that, right? 
uh, and it's just a contract for the, like, I want to sign this, here's the information I have, and then uh, then if, it, if all of that checks out, the signatory service will apply the signature. I mean, all we want to establish is this PPF trace is, is something that I trust to be, uh, to be, right? So one way of sort of establishing that is an FS Verity like partition. So I'll say that all executables are, are, are like, or any exec, uh, at the very minimum, right? Any executable that is generating dynamic BPF bytecode is going to be run from this FS Verity verified partition. And, and, and then the signature service can sort of ensure that based on your environmental setup, this is coming from an FS Verity verify partition and verify that hash for the FS Verity partition and, there. And we could extend the model to have the, like a pre-signed binary section as was described by John earlier, right? Like the, there's nothing prohibiting that. Brandon? Yeah, I mean, early on at Netflix, we tried to get system tap going with, and it had its remote compilation thing and it was a nightmare because service teams had implemented firewalls and when there's an outage and you're trying to run scripts in a hurry, I can't even connect to anything. Networking is s slow when I can connect to things. Um, so it becomes a fairly big barrier to entry. But I understand you could just say that's an operational issue and people just have to figure it out. My, my actual question is, is there any, sometimes when it's just urgent and, and we're ready to, throw anything at it. Is there any way to have like an NMI or a magic sysrq to say, don't do verification, this system is toast, so, I just so. need to run BPF trace? So, I mean, <laughs> if, you, if you put the verification in the gatekeeper program, right, and keep it out, right, then Good. there's nothing prohibiting you from having this magic, like, this secret you release to just disable everything, right? That would help a lot, because it's, it's that situation where it's like, like Netflix is down. You're you're, you're essentially yeah. describing like yeah. we're gonna burn the world after we play yeah. here. Uh, essentially, yeah, and just the, destroy everything. The instance is gonna be destroyed anyway. Yeah. It doesn't matter. Uh, although it does sound like an interesting opportunity for a social engineering attack. I, I mean, I'm sh even if it is a good opportunity, I'm assuming that they have an audit trail when they release that kill key. <laughs> does, does, I mean, like, does anybody here have a signature service running already with like strong identity and like a real fleet? I mean, yes, you guys. Not for BPF. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so you could, well, I mean, I know lots of people have, but it, like usually it's quite complex setup, right? So like, did you consider, you know, hooking into existing, you know, identity services and stuff? Like, I, I, I'm, like if you're going to launch onto this project to create a signature service, that's fine. I mean, it doesn't really involve BPF necessarily, but like that's a that's like a so, whole committee of work and... So I, I, I think <laughs> where we've landed, though, is that the gatekeeper process is, like, per team, right? And the gate, if the gatekeeper process, process is doing the appropriate verification... I, I'm fine from a BPF yeah. side. I think the gatekeeper works fine. I, I'm just more curious, like, if people sort of have scoped the, what this signature service involves. It's not a, it's not a light undertaking as well. I, I think this is very valid, right? Once we hash out how the signatures are going to work, the questions around relocation and, and this stuff, right? Can we do relocation in the kernel? Do we sign what Alexei proposed? We sign the VPF program, uh, the loader program, and the bytecode of the program. The actual implementation of the signature stuff it should be left to experts who already are doing that, right? Like, I, I don't think I can, so, I have the requisite expertise there. What I would say is that, uh, <laughs> like, the, the reference implementation for, like, a signatory service, I would say would be something like SSH Keygen's level of, like, a signatory service, right? Okay. Like, I, I, I need this, I, I have the root key somewhere on disk, and I need to do something with it. It is a toy, and then that's why you have all the other bigger, better implementations that will become someone's GitHub project, most likely. But to, for it to be actually useful in the ecosystem, right? Some mm -hmm. CA should be able to do this, right? And the the this you can you can think about the Istio CA or whatever, uh, sort of implementing a signatory service for this stuff. But there's a lot of groundwork that needs to happen before that. I'm comfortable <laughs> with the BPF stuff. Right? This, this stuff looks like an Istio picture. You can put, put Istio there and yeah. Envoy. Kind of and or CNCF look. Yeah. yeah, I mean you're gonna you're gonna stick whatever system you're using as yep. your as your signatory. Cool. So um, I would like uh, to echo some of your point. I think I finally get is like it's kind of a, what my point initially like uh, correctness is all oh, like a totally safe is very difficult 
Like even verifier is the best uh, to know that, but even that is probably not possible to to be 100% sure that it's uh, like uh, it's uh, secure. Um, but I do see the point. Like you have a signature service, you could be able to get the trust going on, or at least uh, say I have a BBF trace. The least thing I'll do, I will log everything I do. So if you intentionally do something bad, it's log, and you will be caught later. I think it's probably what we do a lot in production. I mean, it's always good to have detection after the fact, but prohibiting a problem before it can become one is even better. Yeah, like, are you yeah. talking about BPM trace in Malaysia, or just the whole spec model for the signature part? Uh, this is like different, like BPF trace is like as an extreme case to so like it's hard to prove it's always yeah. safe. It's yeah. hard to make it safe. Like the, the other extreme is gonna be very simple, like uh, just the exact that program, you know that program. That's the, the other end is more like, uh, but I agree the signature provides uh, the, the spectrum of coverage and uh, whether it's absolutely safe or it's at least I, I know who is doing the bad thing. <laughs> I was going to answer Brendan's question there, right? Like where Brendan mentioned, there's an external signatory service which has sort of availability concerns. And then in the middle of an outage, when you are on a limited availability spectrum, right? You, you, don't, you can't reach the signatory service, what do you do? In that case, there's a thing that I'm proposing today as well, where you say that, look, BPF trace will be allowed to run unsigned code as long as it is in uh, BPF, uh, yeah, in the in the FS Verity partition, right? And then you, we do what you said we do, right? Like we log all the syscalls that are being, uh, we anyways log all the BPF syscalls, the payloads and all that, ship all the byte code that is being done, uh, that is being generated for like offline verification of what, what whatever you want to do with that, right? To do more threat analysis after the fact. But it's, it's one solution if you want to tackle, if your operational needs do demand that, which I think is is a fair ask, right? Like mm -hmm. having to talk to a BPF trace, talk to a signatory service might get more complicated. Yeah. So. so I thought that I understand what's going on. And then like you said, like we still need to figure out like the relocations and all this stuff. And now I'm confused again, because I thought that like we don't really need to figure that out because that's signatory services problem. And like signatory service is like custom implementation for each probably big customer, right? So why do we need to figure out like who does relocations and like when they are done and like what kind of relocations? What, what am I missing? So let's say like in this case, like you can teach your signatory service that like LibBPF is trusted trusted partner and uh, just take the ELF as is before all the relocations, before anything. Just hash the ELF and trust LibBPF to process it correctly. What's the problem with that? Similar to BPF trace, we are saying like we trust BPF trace. I, I, I think that is a fair. All right, then, yeah, I just, I just wanted to make sure, because it's like the pro programs that like I use in LibBPF, doing like a bunch of runtime modifications of like RO data and all the stuff, they are not going away anytime soon, so like we need to plan for that, I guess, as yeah, well. The only thing that we have to agree on is what the extensibility points are, right? So for example, we talked about capabilities. If you don't put those into there now, it's really hard to retrofit them later, right? So which parts do you lock down right now as being the extensibility points, I, and then you leave everything else I got else an impression we are bypassing all that, because we are saying that the, the signature, which probably would be better to call manifest, because it's like not really signature because signature has like this hashing. But anyway, this <laughs> signature slash manifest, right? Yeah. This like black box that just passed through into like the custom BPF hook in the verifier, right? So like we don't need to agree on anything. Like, <laughs> I think you're right. Um, but like I think what you're saying, right, is like you can sign the application and trust the application, right. which is, is like better than what we have now, right? Like, like just doing that probably adds a ton of security to the system. Well, I think what they're at trying to do is also sign the BPF programs themselves, right? Which would be like sort of, in my mind, that's like I first sign the application, solve that problem, and then, then worry about the BPF program, but you know, that's But fine. at some point, they have to have trusted applications, so they can teach that trusted application to do this I, I, uh, signature, right? All of this, right? Like the trust boundary for one environment, right, where you can draw these trust boundaries is going to be very different from where you can draw these trust boundaries on another, another environment. I may be able to trust libpf, right? In that case, three locations are not an issue, right? I can I can sign the program pre-relocation, uh, and I establish a trust boundary along for this particular uh, use case with the kernel and plus some libraries and some uh, tools along with that. Some cases I may not be able to trust that, 
and we need to at least in this particular case we need to cater to all of that or at least ideate on all of these trust boundaries right my worry is that like if something like this is adopted by like fedora or something they'll just like yes and like you won't be able to do like bpf development as like a so normal I, not like corporate I, backed I would development. say that the the key that's trusted should be like uh, like overridable at boot, right? Like with a flag. Like if you want to change the key, go for it. Like that's just like, it would be like a pim string. Like decode this, right? Well, I think it's the, so. So say Fedora did this, right? Or some distro shipped with this, right? It's just a BPF program at boot at init time. Like you should just be able to like delete the command line and be like, okay, now there's no BPF program. Right, like we, you, you okay. shouldn't say like that's why I don't think we want it as like a config flag that somebody can just turn on and then we're just stuck, right? Like, like yeah. your whole system stops working and there's nothing you can do, and and we give you know. What if Fedora bakes this BPF program into the kernel? It's I think like, they probably can. They probably like, will. I mean, they, like with a patch, like they'll patch like the, their kernel. The preload light skeleton, right? Like you, you bake yeah. it into the kernel and like it just automatically boots. So like it's it's simple yeah. like in terms of like deployment right so then like you can't really do anything about it. So this is this is going back to the uh, whole BSC discussion right? What prevents like can we provide a sane implementation now from ourselves like where we can where we can provide a sane reference implementation or this will eventually happen right like. I mean I, I don't see what would prohibit. Fedora from doing this with like, why don't they just ship a kernel module that does this as well, right? Like they could lock it down however they want if they're shipping the kernel. By, by reference implementation, you mean like the reference implementation of the signatory service? And who's, who's going to implement Everything, that? Everything, like the whole ecosystem, right? Like this is, these are how the signature verification is going to work in different trust boundaries. This is what we recommend. These are the goals behind the signature stuff to, to do, uh, these are the, Goals, right? Like which we think is it's relevant for, not for gatekeeping or limiting BPF development. Uh, honestly, like if if a distribution is curtailing BPF development significantly, it's 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 to their detriment. There is a there is sort of a Nash equilibrium here, right? If you make the distribution less useful to somebody, the distribution will be less useful. So and it'll be it'll be less used eventually. I I also I I don't maybe I get the impression that that some people believe, and, and I sort of disagree, like, if you load a signed BPF program, you know that that's the BPF program that you're running, right? But, but you're not fundamentally changing the secure, like, we have lots of BPF programs, like, if you could write to the maps, you can totally break the system, right? So, like, like you've kind of closed down one minor, in, in my, my viewpoint, that, like, that's, okay, so you've closed one minor security problem, but you still have all of these maps that you could DDoS, you could exfiltrate data, you could do like all sorts of things that are just, to me, almost actually probably a bigger security problem than actually the, the actual BPF program. Because mm -hmm. it's, like, it's like a hook with a map that does an L LRU filter on a whatever, right? Like it's Very honestly speaking, from my, the way I see it is it's all supply chain aspects, right? Like the signature service has the, comp I'm trying to call BPF helper foo, right? And the compiler is like, yeah, no, I'm not going to generate bytecode for foo, I'm going to generate bytecode for bar, right? And this is, this could happen, right? Somebody could make your compiler uh, uh, sneak in a binary in a, in, 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 in a thing, but that thing shouldn't be allowed to sign your BPF program then. Just final remark. Like, <laughs> I just don't want to make this. Like, I don't want us to design the system around the assumption that like you will be able to write like all possible or like majority of like useful BPF applications in a way that like their code will not be runtime modifiable. Because I don't think that's realistic. Like, majority of applications right now they do some tweaking. Like, is it is it like libpf or bpf trace generating or like you do like RO data patching before like the program is loading. Like. You change the code, bef well, code or slash data logic, basically, right? Like before you load. So, like, if you are saying like this will work as like a reference implementation only for things that like you write and it's like unmodifiable, that's very limiting. Six, some use cases here, right? From from my perspective that I see, you know, these programs we talked about, how we talked about yesterday, which are fundamentally sort of extending ex uh, extending kernel functionality with C group V1. We want them to be. We want to be sure that these programs are shipped and signed and verifiably built, right? Another use case is a group of BPF programs that you want to allow on the fleet. Like, look, I want to deploy this when something happens. 
and and I want to make sure that those are verifiably built. In the dynamic use, we we want to we want to ensure that whatever we implement here, we provide a solution for dynamic BPF uh, code generation. Right. This is this is very important because we understand that when you trust the application, the BPF program that chips with the application is also trustable because it has been trusted in the build uh, environment. But there are BPF programs that you sometimes not are not attaching to an application currently. Like you have you're just shipping BPF programs that I want to attach. Uh, and do something with that. We, we do that as well. There's a yep. question in the back. Plus one to KP, all of, all of what you said applies in Azure as well, so same. same. For uh, Dynamic, uh, so for program which do the modification, are you able to uh, protect the chain until the program actually run? Because if you can, Verify the signature at the beginning, and then uh, you can I, protect. I believe that's only going to be possible once uh, the dynamic relocation moves into the kernel. Is is it or is not? It would not be possible until okay. the dynamic relocation yeah. moves into the kernel, or some high trusted process in, I believe, the Microsoft case, mm -hmm. which is essentially, I'm guessing, the service account. <laughs> yes. We did. <laughs> I don't think anyone heard any of what you just said. Oh, so like, uh, do, so, the, so if I, if I, if can there is there a situation where we can move all of these things to the? You said this is possible with the loader program currently. Okay. But there will be. We've already moved ninety percent, but there will be cases that it's just like not possible. There will be dynamic modifications. Like BPF trace is a prime example. Like you cannot. So, I, no, so it's, it's only through the signature service or pretty much sounds like what we'll do, like summarizing the discussion, yes. we'll let the helper uh, that can check signature of whatever, signature of a map, signature of the program, and a bunch of hooks throughout the verifier at the beginning, at the end, including that can be paired together with standard LSM hook, like bin PRM, where it can do, let's say, IMA hash, and based on IMA digest of the, recognize that this is actually BPF trace is running, and said, well, this is BPF trace is now trying to loading, connect these two events that BPF trace started to run and BPF trace is doing BPF syscall. And at this point say, well, this is my policy, this is how I want to implement. I don't care whether anything that BPF trace is loading has a signature, just allow this process that initiate or based on the user. So it seems that the only thing like reasonable we can do without like shooting ourselves and uh, stopping the progress is to make it as flexible as possible where the policy will decide anything. Like whatever combination it wants to enforce. So, so next steps then, right? What do we have to implement? We need the, the signature helper, right? We need these interesting hooks in the verifier. Yes, and, that's it. And where is the signature stored? Where does, it's is minor. it syscall? Minor. Yeah, okay. Atter. Okay. Okay. Atter. No, Atter. No new instructions. Okay. Damn it. We can also probably preserve the signature and dump it in BPF too. Microphone. It would probably make sense to preserve this manifest. I like manifest more. But uh, <laughs> like preserve it and like uh, provide it in BPF proc info. So like BPF tool and like other tools can actually show you. But it's like, quite a certificate, right? Certificate is a bunch of other things. And sure. Yeah. But like signature for me is like SHA-256. It's like that signature. No, no. <laughs> I'm not a security person, sorry. All right. Uh, any other questions on this from me, or should we give someone up, uh, else a chance to talk about uh, signing stuff up here? We'll come back to uh, my, yeah, my, my topic is a very simpler policy use case. So no signing going on there. Yeah, then you're the next one. Yeah. Cool. Thank I you. I have a live demo, so... Uh -oh. Thank you. Uh -oh.